Okay, welcome to our Bible Basics study for tonight. We are continuing on the topic of the spiritual foundation, building right from the start. And we are continuing tonight with the topic, discerning the foundation, discerning the foundation. And that's going to be our topic for tonight by the grace of God. Discerning the foundation, discerning the foundation. Now, I want to read for you our base foundational passage, which is from the book of Luke, chapter 6. So let's find that in your Bible, Luke, chapter 6. And we are going to read from verse 46 to 49. And why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. 49, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. The ruin of that house was great. Glory to God. That's Luke chapter 6. Verse 46 to 49. Now, last week we dived into a number of things dealing with the foundation and looking at the foundation as a prerequisite and why the foundation is necessary and the purpose of the building. And we ended on a powerful note by saying that God wants us to be his habitation, that we were created to be a habitation of the spirit of the living God. Most profound statement that we made out of the scriptures. We were created to be a habitation for the Holy Spirit. Now this week, we are going to be looking at this topic, discerning the foundation, discerning the foundation, very important. Now in the natural world, let's look at the natural and go to the spiritual. In the natural world, foundations are extremely important in building construction. You cannot erect a building without a foundation. If a foundation is not laid properly, the building that rests on that foundation that is not laid properly will be in danger. And of course, the people who are using that building will also be in danger. The same is true in the spiritual. Remember now, when Jesus is teaching, he uses natural things to convey spiritual truth, to convey eternal truth to his hearers. Now, a wrong spiritual foundation will lead to catastrophic spiritual consequences. One cannot build their lives on a foundation that has no surety, number one, no strength, number two, and no durability, number three. So let's go again. You cannot build your life on a foundation that has no surety, no strength, and no durability. So like the natural world, which has its own set of, of, of physical and chemical laws that govern the material and the way in which the foundation is constructed, the spiritual world or the spirit realm has its own set of laws that ought to be adhered to, its own set of principles. Now, these laws or principles are found in the most simplistic form being expressed in what I call the teachings that we receive. So here is what I'm simply saying to you. The teachings that you receive 
affect and lay the foundation on which you are going to build. It is therefore incumbent, necessary, that we become aware of the teachings we are receiving and learn to discern and dissect. Now, those two words, discern and dissect. What am I talking about tonight? Discerning the foundation. And what am I zoning in on? The teachings that are laying the foundation. How do I discern and dissect? We're going to look at that in a little bit. Wrong teaching will produce wrong believing. And wrong believing will produce wrong actions. Let's say it again. Wrong teaching will uh, uh, produce wrong believing. And wrong believing will produce wrong actions. Similarly, right believing and right actions are dependent on right teachings. So if our teaching is not right, nothing else can be right after that. Everything else will be skewed, lean, bent, out of square, out of shape. Nothing can be correct if the teaching that you're receiving is not correct because the teaching that you receive produces in you faith and produces in you action. So teaching that is true according to its alignment with the will of God, the character of God, and the way of God is teaching that is true or teaching that is right. Let me say it again. Teaching that is true according to its alignment with the will of God, the character of God, and the way of God is teaching that is right. And that is the most simplistic form of expression concerning your foundation. That is the most simplistic form of expression concerning your foundation. Now we need to look at this and see how do we then begin to discern and dissect whether or not what we are hearing and what we are receiving is right and is true. I think that's where the, the Bible student has his concern because the truth is that you trust the man of God or the woman of God who is before you, that what they are bringing to you is truth and it is right. Many of us, we don't know how to dissect and discern. And so we accept what we are hearing and what is being given to us as truth. And then like obedient children, we run with it. We run with it. And then we begin to realize later on in life that, look, I have been running with something that is not correct. I have been running with something that is not true. Just over the weekend, I met uh, the bishop that baptized me years ago. And we were talking. And the man was so humble to say something to me that touched my heart. He said to me, Many years ago, he used to do some things, and now he realized that the things he used to do and teach is not right. And he began to explain to me. And I stood there in awe, looking at this man. And he said, if I should do it all over again, there are some things that I would not do. And it touched my heart to hear a senior man of God saying that and admitting to the fact that, look, there were some things that he held dear as teachings that when he examined the scriptures today in his maturity, he realizes that those things were not true and they were unnecessary and they caused a lot of damage and a lot of pain. 
that when I heard that, I, my heart became humble to realize that, look, it is possible that we can be so uh, 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 vehement in, our, in the way we push a thing and push a doctrine and push a message that we don't realize that what we are pushing is our own opinion, our own mindset, or even the cultural presuppositions of a church or a denomination that really and truly has nothing to do with the word of God in principle, in precept, and in practice. And if we are going to grow as children of God, as church overall, we're going to have to come back to the drawing board and examine everything that we have been teaching, everything that we have been saying, everything that we have been doing, and really ask the question, one pertinent question, is this glorifying God? And is this causing people to be drawn to Christ? This is very important. Because look, we have to discern the foundation. We have to learn now how to look at our foundation and see, is there something wrong in my foundation if I have one? Or do I really have a foundation any at all? And so some of these things are what we are going to be looking at as we, as we progress. Now we call this basics, but really and truly, we are going deep. We are going deep. Now, there is a woman by the name of Margaret Armenius, Margaret Armenius, and I read a blog that she wrote. It's called Eight Tests for Decision Making. Maybe some of you have seen this. Maybe some of you have not seen it. But she cited um, these eight tests from a biblical counseling library from Hope for the Heart that she read. And Margaret says that it helps in the decision-making process. Now, when I began to look at this, these eight questions, my spiritual eyes began to open in a new way. I believe that it is also critical, these eight questions are also critical in the discernment process to determine if a teaching is true and if a teaching is right. This is necessary because every spiritual teaching that we receive will affect the type and quality of our spiritual foundation. We cannot leave this to chance, the whole matter of what we are hearing, what we are receiving to chance. We can't leave it to chance without investigation. And so what I'm saying to you, what I'm going to present to you tonight is a way to investigate every teacher and preacher that you hear. Yes, you, you are going to be at an advantage tonight because you're going to learn how to discern and dissect. You are going to be able to tell if the type and quality of the teaching you are hearing is sound. Even if you are not deep in the scriptures, you're going to come out with something. Because I've made this very simple so that you can get it and run with it. Now, let me go through the eight biblical tests that were uh, given by Margaret. Number one is called the scriptural test, the scriptural test. Now, this is very important, the whole matter of the scriptural test. This is the first one that we are looking at tonight, the scriptural test. Now, the scriptural test simply says, has God already spoken about it in his word? And we're talking about a teaching that you're hearing or a message that you're hearing. In order to run the scriptural test, you have to be familiar with the Bible. You have to be familiar with the content and the context of the scriptures. So 
important to the believer, important to the disciple, is that he continues to and consistently reads the word of God. Not with any devotional, not with any book, but the, but the, the, the disciple really and truly just opening the Bible and read, read it from Genesis to Revelation. Read it to see what is contained inside here. Because if you don't know what is contained inside there, eh, at least in narrative, you have to know what is contained inside this Bible, at least in narrative form. Very important. So here is, here is the scriptural test. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So in other words, everything that we have inside here, no matter how it looks, is given by the inspiration of God. And the Bible said it is profitable for doctrine, profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, profitable for instruction in righteousness. That's the first thing that you are going to run, run with, the scriptural test. The second thing that Margaret uh, referenced is what is called the secrecy test. Now she's dealing with this in, the, in, 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 in teaching us how to know how to make a decision. Eight questions to ask before you make a decision. The second one is the secrecy test. Um, just bear with me, I'm gonna come to this in, in, in the manner of teaching, just learn some things here. Secrecy test says, would it bother me if everyone knew this was my choice? That's, that's what the question is asking. Proverbs 11 verse three says, the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Is it going to bother me if everyone knew this was my choice? That's the second, second test. The third test is what is called the survey test. The survey test. Now, when you look at the survey test, the question is simple. It says, what if everyone followed my example? What if everyone followed my example? This is from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So the Bible calls for uh, uh, us to be an example. What if everyone followed my example? How is that going to play out? Then number four is what we call the spiritual test. The spiritual test. Now, these are very important questions to ask. Am I being people pressured or spirit led to make this decision? We're talking about decision making. Okay, am I being people pressured or spirit led? Galatians 1 verse 10, for do I now persuade men or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So in other words, you can't call yourself a servant of Jesus if you're a man pleaser. So that's that's simple what the scripture is saying. Spiritual test. Concerning my decision, am I being people pressured or spirit led? Number five is the stumbling test. Stumbling, stumbling test. Now, very important. When you're going to make a decision, could this cause another person to stumble? Romans chapter 14, verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Come on. What I'm doing, will it cause another brother, another sister to stumble or become weak? Very important. Then number six, the serenity test. Serenity test. Oh, I love this. It says, have I prayed 
and received peace about the decision that I'm going to make. Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Have you prayed and received the peace of God? Did you receive the peace of God? You see, sometimes we pray and we are looking for a word from God. But what God gives is the peace of God. Come on now. So that's the serenity test. Then number seven is the sanctification test. Sanctification test. Now the sanctification test says, will this keep me from growing in the character of Christ? We're talking about the actions that we are taking, the decisions that we are taking, very much connected to Luke chapter six. Will this keep me from growing in the character of Christ? What I'm about to do, will it stop me from growth in Jesus? Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So in other words, I am being changed. Sanctified means being set apart unto. So I'm being set apart unto the glory of God in Christ Jesus, being conformed to what he is and who he is. So will this action cause me to stop growing in the character of Christ? And number eight, last but not least, very important. I think they leave the best for last. Number eight says, it is the supreme test. Does this glorify God? Does this glorify God? This decision that I'm making. First Corinthians 10 verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So what is my purpose? My purpose is to bring glory to God. That's my purpose. That's, that's why one of the reasons why God created me to bring glory to his name so right here uh, you have from the hope for the heart biblical counseling library presented by margaret uh margaret armenius the eight uh tests questions that you ask concerning a decision that you are about to make before you make them and once you answer these eight questions in the affirmative towards Christ Jesus and the good of your neighbor, then you can proceed to, 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 to take your decision accordingly. Now, I looked at these eight questions and the Lord began to speak to me about teaching, about teaching and how these eight questions can be applied to discern whether or not a teaching that you are receiving is true, is right, and is pure. Are you ready for this? Because we are going to discern and dissect. Now, in discerning and dissecting teaching, Eight questions that you are going to ask. Eight questions that you are going to ask. Very important. And we're going to go into this very seriously. Number one is what we call the scriptural test or the Berean challenge. The scriptural test or the Berean challenge. The question that you will ask is a very Simple question. I'm putting it in the chat for you. Question number one. Is this something God is saying in his word? Now, many of us, we hear teachings and believe it or not, a lot of teachings that are out there are not backed by biblical principle, precept and practice. It is not backed by scripture at all. When we say backed by scripture, we're not talking about you can find it 
uh, you can only find it verbatim or literally in the scriptures. No, we are saying that it is not according to scripture in spirit, in principle, in precept, in practice. That's what we mean by uh, it must be conformed to the word of God. Now, here is what the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 says. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, listen to me. Every teaching that you receive, it is incumbent upon you, the disciple, to go back to the word of God and begin to search the scriptures to see whether or not the thing that is being taught, the thing that is being preached is so. While preaching, listen, while preaching will affect your heart and, and prick your heart to move. And that may prick your heart to move for a certain period of time, for a certain season of time, to, de to, to get a certain response out of you. Teaching is different. Teaching enters into your foundation. Teaching enters into your subconscious. Teaching becomes a stronghold in your mind. And so it is very important that when you are being taught something, the scriptural test is run on that thing. Here is what Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 says. Write down all these scriptures. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. Now let me read verse 19 for clarity so that you can get. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits. Because there are those who have familiar spirits who are in the pulpits. And unto wizards that peep. Yes, these prophets that everything they see, they see, they see, they see, and they're not seeing nothing that God is showing. Okay? Unto these wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Why do you go to the, to, to, to the dead for the living? For the living to the dead? That's a question. I, I just phrased it around for you for you to understand. Now, verse 20 says, to the law and to the testimony. In other words, go back to the word. That's what it means there by law. It simply is, a, is the Hebrew word Torah. It means the word of God. To the law, to the word, to the Torah, and to the testimony. In other words, to the attestation that this word is factual and true. Testimony there simply means the precept of the word of God, the evidence that what is written is true. So to the law and to the testimony, if they speak, not according to this word, not according to what is written in, 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 in word and in precept, in other words, in word and in practice or in word and in evidence, it is because there is no light in them. And we know now that light here is, 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 is being referred to, the, it, 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 it's a figurative metaphor for the spirit of God. So in other words, if they cannot produce, okay, the word, the message, the teaching, the preaching, the encouragement, the motivation, according to what is written in the word of God, in, 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 in precept and in practice, then it is not something that is coming from God. This is the scriptural test we have to apply. Luke 24, the book of Luke 24, verse 44. Let's, let's look at Luke 24, 44. I'm telling you, this is going to get hot tonight. Luke 24, verse 44. It says, and he said to them, this is Jesus speaking. These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Those are the three divisions of the scriptures that we have. The law of Moses, the first five books of Moses, the prophets, all the prophetic books, and the Psalms. So Jesus said, look, all, all that is written inside there concerning me, 
said, look, they must come to pass. In other words, those words are eternal. They are truth. They are pure. They can be tested. They can be verified. And the messages must align with what the Lord sovereign has said. John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. Here is what it says again. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, in other words, scriptural test says, whatever is being preached or being taught from scripture must testify about Jesus Christ in some way, shape, or form. It will either testify of, his, of, of God's will through him, God's character through him, or God's way through him. It will testify of Jesus Christ. Scriptural test. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, and we're going to visit this book very regularly tonight. Psalm 119 and verse 130. It says this. It says, the entrance of thy words give light. It gives understanding unto the simple. Scriptural test says, once that word is being released out of the the light, the revelation, light revelation of the spirit of God, then it will give understanding even to people who are simple, people who are foolish, people who are silly. So here we have the scriptural test to examine the teaching you are receiving. Is this something God is saying in his word? Is this something God is saying in his word? Very important that you run that test before you begin to cement these things into your foundation. Number two, the secrecy test. We're still using the same uh, 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 words that Margaret used. Okay, number two is the secrecy test. Would it bother me if others knew what I'm being taught? Would it bother me? Would it bother you if others knew what you are being taught? Is this teaching being done in secret and meant only for an enlightened few? In other words, when you receive this teaching, then they say now that you are enlightened, you are better than the others, you are more superior and more righteous and more sanctified and more this and more that and more, 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 more. Secrecy test. Now, Isaiah 45, verse 19. Here's what the Bible says. I have not spoken in secret <laughs> in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. God said, I, I did not speak in secret. I spoke plainly for everybody to hear me and for those who hear me to judge what I'm saying too. I, I'm not saying nothing in secret. So what is this about these these teachers who they want to teach you, but they have to take you into some secret place, into some closed group in order to teach you, in order to communicate to you what they are teaching. And then what they are teaching you, they say, hey, don't tell anybody else. Don't communicate with anybody else. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that, 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 that. It is, it is secret because when you know this, you will become more and better than those who didn't hear it. Let's, let's examine the word. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law or of this, or of this word. Okay? Now, let's, let's look at that uh, uh, for, for example. God says the things that are revealed, those things that are revealed are to be taught. Those things that are revealed are to be disclosed. 
It must be disclosed to others and to their children. In other words, God is not giving you any revelation for any secret meeting and secret cult. No, that's, that's not what he's giving this teaching for. He's giving this teaching so that you can commit it to your children and commit it to others. So what you are receiving, is it going to bother you if people know what you are being taught? Because there are some things that are being taught that if we ever know what they are being taught, it would be a whole different kettle of fish. No pastor is going to, uh, no true pastor is going to draw away a, a certain sect of people and, and, and tell them, come, let me teach you the secrets of prophecy or the secrets of, of, of seeing in the realm of the spirit or the secrets of this or the secrets of that. Secrets of what? What is revealed must be disclosed. And so if it is a teaching or a message that is revealed to you, you must disclose it. If you can't disclose it, then something is wrong with it. And maybe it is not coming from God any at all. The book of John chapter 18 and verse 20. Jesus answered them, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. This is the Bible. In secret I have said nothing. So what is this whole matter of, 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 of secrecy, secret teachings and secret messages and, 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 and uh, secret this and secret that and, and hidden this and hidden that? No, 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 no. Apply the secrecy test to, it, to, to, to what you are hearing. Is this only for a few, a selected few, or is this for the body of Christ? Is this necessary for the body of Christ? And if this is not necessary for the body of Christ at large to get this, then I don't want it. Because something is wrong with this. Jesus said, in secret I have taught nothing. I have openly taught where everybody can hear what I'm saying and judge what I'm saying. And understand what I'm saying and discern and dissect what I'm saying. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Will it bother me if others knew I am being taught. And is this teaching being done in secret and meant only for an enlightened few? The secrecy test. You know, one of the things that I find myself doing is that whenever God gives me a revelation, my mouth can't keep quiet. It's like I want others to come into this thing and to hear this thing and to be partakers of this thing. But you watch them secret teachers who gather to themselves disciples to commit to them secrecy. You, you watch them. Dangerous. Number three, the survey test. Survey test. Very important. Now let's look at this one. The survey test. We're dealing with discerning and dissecting the foundation. How do we tell that my foundation is being built right? And what do I allow to be building blocks in my foundation? Let's look at the survey test. What would be the consequence if others followed the example of what I believe? Come on. What would be the consequence if others begin to follow the example of what I believe. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. 
be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. I am not obligated to follow you and you are not obligated to follow me except I am following Jesus Christ. Imitate me just as I also imitate Jesus. Follow me as I follow Jesus. What is going to be the consequence if people follow what I believe? And you can, you can immediately begin to look at this and see how many people have been damaged and destroyed by men of God who come out of the closet and begin to, 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 to propagate a, a, a message and begin to show forth an example that is not in keeping with the example of Jesus Christ. And what has been the result? The destruction of their faith. What, what is going to be the consequence? If you begin to follow what I believe, what is the consequence for you? If I begin to tell people to follow me, follow my example, follow what I believe, what's going to be the outcome for them? I need to answer these questions about the teachings that I'm receiving. What's going to be the outcome if I begin to do what this teaching is requiring of me? Where is this going to lead me in terms of my growth in Jesus, my maturity in Jesus, my conformity to the image of Jesus Christ? Where is this going to lead me? You see, these are the days when we must ask some tough questions and take some tough decisions because my foundation is critical to my spiritual growth. And I'm not just going to allow any and anything to enter into my foundation. Number four. No, sorry. Let's continue. Number three. Galatians chapter one, verse six to seven. Galatians chapter one, verse six to seven. Let's look at some scriptures. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you mm -hmm, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So Paul is, Paul is talking to the Galatian church and saying to them, look, who gave you this example to follow? This is not what I gave to you. This is not what I left with the church. This is not the example you saw of me. Who gave this to you? And he began to, to defend the gospel that he preached unto them and even his apostleship. He began to defend it in, 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 in the book of Galatians and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there were those who came in and began to teach some things that produced a different example. Isaiah, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Let's look at that one first. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who put curse on you? Who witchcraft you? Who juju you? That you should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Are you so stupid? Having begun in spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So Paul is asking some serious questions of the Galatian church. Whose example are you following? This is not the example I gave you. You got a different teaching. Somebody came in and taught you something that I did not teach you. And you have entered it into your foundation and began to practice it. Who gave you this thing? And why are you doing this? Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Let's look at prophet Isaiah. Let's hear what he says now. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. He says... Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, 
but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. In other words, listen what is happening. The people, the fear of God in the people changed because men began to teach them things that are not divine, but human. Look how powerful teaching is. Teaching can change your fear of God. And if we look at the responses of believers today and you do a survey and you look at how Christians are behaving, you will come out with one conclusion that many do not fear God. And you may ask, but why is it that Christians do not fear God? They're not afraid of God anymore. Why? Why do they not fear God anymore? And when we talk about fear of God, I'm not talking about it in the sense of worship. I'm talking about Christians thinking about the sovereign God. They are not terrified by him. By the prospects of who he is and what he can do. They're not terrified. And so they, they, their obedience to him is, is, is like a yo-yo. Your fear of God can be affected by teaching. And, and look what the result is. The result is that we, the, the teaching is producing people who draw near to God with their mouth and with their lips, but not with their heart. And what has this affected? their foundation, how they are reacting and building their spiritual life is one that has no ground or basis in the fear of the Almighty. So let's do the survey test on the teaching we are receiving. What would be the consequence if others followed the example of what I believe or of what I am being taught? Number four, the spiritual test. Let's look at the spiritual test. The spiritual test says, am I being forced to believe the opinions of a man? Or is it truly from the spirit of the word of God? Notice I didn't say the letter of the word. I said the spirit of the word. Because there are some things that you cannot do today. Am I being forced to believe the opinions of a man? Or is it truly from the spirit of the word of God? Now Galatians 2 verse 1 to 4. Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 to to four. Let's find that scripture, Galatians chapter two, verses one to four. We're going to read that. It says, then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation, meaning the Jews, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. See, Paul is wise. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, in other words, he was a Gentile to the bone, was compelled to be circumcised. Okay, so we are, Paul is dealing with an issue here. And that because... A false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes, where, where, where am I? Yes, uh, spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. 
So here is, here is Paul now dealing with a matter. The spirituality, the veracity of the spirituality of what is being taught by him. Paul said, I came up to you by revelation and preached to you the gospel without any dictates and demands and requirements of the law. In other words, you received it by grace. Very important. It wasn't my opinion. Because if I was coming to you with my opinion, then being a Jew, I would require of you certain things that are required in the law. But Paul said, look, that is not how I came. I came to you by the revelation of the spirit of God. And I communicated to you the gospel as it was communicated to me by Christ. Very important. When you read the rest of that passage, you will see some things that are there. This was his defense of the gospel of Christ to the Galatian church. Now, there are some churches, they have some teachings, brethren, that are the opinions of men. They are the fears of men, but they have nothing to do with the revelation of scripture. And these opinions and these fears go into their rule books and their doctrinal books, and they try to find justification for it. But when you look at it deeply with the eyes of the spirit, looking through the lens of Christ, you begin to realize that these are the opinions of men. And when you ask, what is the root of this teaching? What is the root of this message that you are preaching? How did you come by this? You will realize that it was some individual in the church who had an opinion, a strong opinion about something based on their cultural uh, uh, climatizations, a strong opinion about something based on their fear, a strong opinion about something based on what they heard somebody said without even uh, testing it to see if it is true. And then they push that to you. And that became a part of your foundation. Even still today, there are people teaching that, oh, prophecy has ceased. The apostles, the gift of apostle and the gift of prophet is no more. That died with John the Revelator. And you find people in that church that have never received a current prophetic word from the Lord. Or even, even know that God could speak to them today. They don't even have faith to believe God for healing. They depend on the doctor and the pills. They don't even believe that deliverance can happen. And so they live with their demons that are afflicting them, saying it is my sickness and my sickness and my sickness. I don't have no sickness. And all of this because of what? Wrong teaching that has entered into the foundation. The spiritual test, you must apply it. Am I being forced to believe the opinions of a man? Or is it truly from the spirit of the word of God? Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, to the teaching which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. A lot of that is going on today. A lot of that is going on today. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. We're talking about running the spiritual test. Colossians chapter 2. And verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy 
Eh? They are sophisticated messages that don't produce nothing spiritual. They are so-called wise sayings that has no wisdom in it. Beware of these people. You have to beware of these kind of philosophies. Vain deceit, deception. Messages that come, but they are deceptive messages. They don't produce anything. Eh? Like they come, today is the 16th of March, 2021. And then they come with something and says, today you must sow $316 to activate this teaching that you are receiving. Not 316 Jamaican dollars. It must be 316 US dollars or 316 British pounds sterling or 316 euros. You better watch out. Yes. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 to 23 says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the bodies of Christ, let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, come on now, if you be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, the elements of the world, the teachings of the world, the principles of the world. Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things indeed have a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Run the spiritual test on these things. Because when you run the spiritual test, you must come out with liberty in Christ rather than bondage into something else. Matthew 15 and verse 2 to 5. Let's see that. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 2. Why? Then let me read verse one. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. You see, they, they, they're trying to be spiritual here by doing some fleshly things. So here's Jesus now. Jesus answered and said, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? <laughs> I love Jesus. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he that cursed father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Run the spiritual test. The spiritual test says, Am I, by this teaching, am I being pushed to a tradition that runs counter to what God demands of me in his word? And when I, when I, when I say what God demands of me in his word, I mean what God demands of me in his word in light of Jesus Christ. So here we had some people, some Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, coming to Jesus, looking all spiritual with their flowing garments in their offices and their titles. Rabbi this and author that, coming to Jesus because they, 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 they write the scriptures and they interpret the scriptures and they are in the office of the Pharisee. They know the scriptures and they come to Jesus with their vainly puffed up mind with their tradition presenting it as spiritual. Dead spirituality. And Jesus exposed it. The teaching that you are receiving, is it making you to come alive in Christ? You see, you have to run this spiritual test. 
Because not every teaching we receive or we hear or message that we hear is making us to come alive in Jesus. The teaching you are receiving, is it causing your heart to burn within you? That you want to go deeper in Jesus and know more about him and do what he wants you to do and, and connect to him in a deeper way. Run the spiritual test. This is very important because many things that we are hearing are really and truly the opinions of men. Number five, the stumbling test. If I continue to hold to my teaching, would others be led to sin by it? If I continue to hold to my teaching or to my belief, would others be led to sin by it? Will I cause others to stumble? Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Mm -hmm. No man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You see, there are some things that are maybe okay for you because spiritually, you are mature to handle some things, but you cannot present it as a teaching. Because if you present it as a teaching, then those who are not able to bear it will begin to stumble by it. And that's one of the things that has been happening. For example, I'll give you an example. You find that we, are, we have gotten teachings of fasting, for example, that in order for you to hear God, you must go into 21 days of lockdown and God will hear you. And you must go into 40 days of lockdown and they present these 21 days and these 40 days and these 14 days and these seven days as if it was the formula to hearing God. And then because you have not taught what fasting really is, but begin to teach fasting as if to say it is a key that unlocks the mouth of God to speak to you. then the person who is doing it is so bent on hearing something that they go through 21 days and they come out hearing something, but it ain't God. Because what they want to hear has already been programmed in their soul by virtue of their desire. And so they will come out with an answer that does say the Lord, but really and truly it is does say my soul. And the end result is that the person really and truly is stumbling, committing sin, because what they are saying that God is saying is not of God in the first place, sin number one. And what they are doing is not the will of God, sin number two. And then they will get others to join them, number three. And then it will become a whole raucous caucus of foolishness and mess. And then at the end of it, you who never went to fasting and start following the man who went to 21 days, come out and say, God said, you start asking questions about whether or not God did really say, and if God is speaking in this time, and a whole string of events start happening. And in the first place, what is really wrong was the teaching about fasting that the person received. And how it is connected to, to hearing God. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. Revelation 2 and verse 14. Let's look at this in regard to stumbling. It says, But I have a few things against you, because you, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. That's Revelation 2.14. So here is Jesus talking to the, the angel of the church at Pergamos. He said, look, you have allowed, eh? you have allowed the doctrine of Balaam to prevail in your church. And because of this, the children are stumbling. Two doctrines that he hates, the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I will teach this sometime, not tonight. And so by virtue of teaching, you can cause people to stumble. It's right there in the scriptures. The book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 7. Let's look at Malachi, chapter 2, and verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Now here, here, here is God saying the priest. It is important that the priest, the one who is supposed to teach the word of God, he should have knowledge. He should have understanding. He should have wisdom. And people should inquire at his lips. So when he opens his mouth, it's, it's teaching that is coming forth. But instead of teaching coming forth, what is happening? What they are releasing is a corruption of the covenant that God has made with the house of Levi or the covenant that God has with the teachers. There is a specific thing that, that God wants them to teach. There, there are specific principles that God wants them to teach, but that is not what is happening. What is coming out of the mouth of the teachers is corruption. And by virtue of this, by virtue of what they are saying, they are the ones that have caused the people to stumble. When you see how important teaching is. You see, these, these offices of Christ, they are no joke because there are specific judgments that are, that are assigned to each office, right? And teachers have a serious judgment if they teach wrong teaching. The book of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 16, so it, we are seeing that it is possible that the teachers can teach wrong things and cause people to stumble, cause people to sin. Okay, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 16. For the leaders of these people causes them to err, causes them to sin, causes them to go astray. And they that are led of them are destroyed. Oh my God. So it is possible that the leaders can teach you things that can cause you to go astray, to stumble, to sin. And the end result of that is that you are destroyed. Again, all of this is entering into your foundation because it is producing an action out of you. First Samuel chapter 2, the book of First Samuel chapter 2. Here is what it says. Verse 17 says, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And verse 24 says, Nay, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. What is transgression? It is sin against the law, sin against the word of God. So in other words, their example became a teaching. People learn by your example. And if your example is causing people to transgress, that's dangerous. 
People do not only just learn by what you say, but they learn by what you do. And even your very actions are teachings. Because by virtue of what you do, you are proving what you believe. You're proving what you believe by virtue of what you have been taught. So teaching is very important. You can cause people to stumble by your teaching. I, my wife showed me a video of uh, a teacher who was correcting a student's math paper. And the student write two plus two equals 22. And it caused one big thing, right? And she said, no, it's, it's two plus two equals four. And even the principal agreed that two plus two equals 22. And the long and short of it is that they had to, to let go the woman because of the protests and all of that. And then they brought the cameras to, 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 show, to, to show that the, the woman is getting a severance check. And when she looked at it, my God, they added up her, her, her pay to um, $4,000. Uh, $4, this is two, two plus two, $4,000. And the woman said, no, this is wrong. My check is wrong. Two plus two is not four. Two plus two is 22. You don't owe me $4,000. You owe me $22,000. And the cameras were there looking on and seeing what, what is this principle going to do? Because two plus two is 22 and not four. You see how you can lead a society in the wrong way by virtue of your opinion and by virtue of what you perceive to be right in your own eyes and the devastating consequences that it may cause and produce what I'm teaching, will it cause others to stumble? Very important. Will it cause me to stumble if I accept it in my foundation? We're talking about discerning and dissecting the foundation. Is there anything in my foundation that is causing me to stumble? Very important. Number six, the serenity test. Have I prayed about this teaching and received peace from God about it? I have been teaching you. There are about 11 lessons that I see there in, in, in the video list or possibly more. I've been teaching you for a whole year now. I have been teaching you. The question is, have you prayed about my teachings? Have you been receiving peace from God about my teachings? First John chapter four and verse one. Beloved, believe not every spirit. I am a spirit. Uh -huh. I am a spirit in flesh. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Try the spirits to see whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, there are some things in this book that can help you in trying the spirit. God's methods of communication and uh, also discerning. Um, whether or not um, a method or a voice is, is really from God. And there are also some things in deliverance and necessity that you can find to help you in the discernment process, to, to find a method in discerning things logically. Okay? So First John 4 verse 1, try the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. Second Timothy chapter four. Let's go to second Timothy chapter four and verse three. It says, for the time will come 
when they will not endure sound teaching. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And so here is, here is the truth of the end times. In the end times, teachers will come who will teach people what their lusts are desiring. And this is a fact. And this is true. Okay? Because what? Many false prophets and many false teachers have gone out into the world. Your, their, your love of them is more important to them than the truth of God's word. Fame is more important to them than God's truth. So they will teach you what you want to hear, tell you what you want to hear, and give you methods and methodologies and ways, 10 steps, 5 steps, 6 steps, in, in to, to, to achieve this and to, to achieve that, mixed with new age philosophy. And it's going to sound good to you. And it's going to sound pleasing to you. And it's going to sound nice. But it is not true. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heiresses, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. This is one of the things that is happening now. Teachers are coming out now to say, look, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. And some of the most profound and pro prolific uh, um, uh, men of God are saying these things. Listen, the moment they begin to say that Jesus is not the only way, he's a false prophet and a false teacher. And I'm at no obligation to listen to him or to listen to her anymore. And I have to call it what it is. And I'm not going to pretty it up because, because they have the title of bishop or prophet, apostle or arch, whatever. The moment they depart from Christ, the Bible says we should avoid them. The book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take ye therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. This is speaking to the pastors. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For this I know that after my departing, grievous wolves. So Paul calls them grievous wolves. Shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. How will they not spare the flock? By teaching things. By feeding the saints things that are not of God. So have I prayed about this teaching and received peace from God about it? It is not everything that you are going to know. We don't know everything. And there are those who will come and they will begin to teach. I will listen what they have to say. One of the things that you must do is to pray and pray about this teaching. If you don't understand it, Pray about it. Ask God to give you a revelation about it so that you can have peace with it. Because here is truth. Here is truth. Many of you, because of your foundational background in, 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 in church, you have been taught some things that today what you are hearing is contrary to those things. And so because of what is in your foundation, there is a resistance to what you are hearing now. And your resistance to what you're hearing now has no grounding or basis in sound doctrinal truth, but, but in your affiliation to a doctrine connected to a denomination. And so you, you, you will come out, you will hear some people coming out and saying, oh, that doesn't sit well in my spirit. What is your spirit? What spirit are you talking about? The doctrine of your denomination that you've heard that has no bearing on truth but the opinions of men, is that the spirit you're talking about? 
or are you talking about a sound understanding of the word of God in principle, in truth, in practice, in precept, in, in accordance to the will, the way, and the word of God? Is that what you are talking about? Or are you just talking about what is in your soul and you are being offended by truth? Pray about it, friends, so that God can give you peace. Number seven, the final test, number seven. We call this one the sanctification test. The sanctification test. Will this teaching cause me to grow in the knowledge, revelation, and character of Jesus Christ? Very important. This teaching that I'm hearing. Is it causing me to grow, to mature in knowledge, in revelation, and in the character of Jesus? Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. No, not the last one. I think we have another one. Sorry. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is no growth spiritually. There is no maturing spiritually if you are not growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so there are some things that we are hearing, some things that, that are being taught to us that really and truly is a waste of our time is a waste of our time spiritually because it is not helping us to grow in knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is very important. For me to grow, the knowledge of Jesus Christ must increase in me. Revelation of Jesus Christ must increase in me. And if that is not happening, there is no maturing. So what am I putting in my foundation? What am I putting as a fertilizer in my foundation? What, what am I sprinkling at my roots? What, what, what are the building blocks am I laying down there? The sanctification test. Is this teaching drawing me to Jesus or is it pushing me away from Jesus? Is this teaching giving me uh, the methods of men or is it giving me the, the principles of Christ? We have to ask these questions. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. My God. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't this powerful? Darkness can only be removed. By the knowledge. Of the glory of God. In the face of Jesus. What am I putting in my foundation? Is this drawing me. To see Jesus. And his glory. Philippians chapter 3. The book of Philippians. Chapter 3. And verse 8 to 11. Yea, countless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. What, what are the things that Paul is counting as loss? Here, here, here are the things. Paul says, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any man think he hath whereof he may trust or boast in the flesh, I have more. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. So I'm, I'm not any DBDB low class Israelite. I am high. And I was circumcised on day eight. In other words, I entered into the covenant of Abraham. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. And Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. In other words, he's a doctor. Okay. Concerning zeal. He said, I was persecuting the church. You didn't have more zeal than me. He said, touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. I did everything that is required inside there. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In other words, 
Paul says, all of that, all of that knowledge, all of that action, all of those achievements, uh, uh, socially and religiously and, 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 and familiarly, he said, all of that, he said, that's nothing. Because it did not push me to Jesus. And so here he says, now, I count all of that loss for the knowledge, the excellent knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, all of those things before, and do count them but dung. Eh? You, you know what dung is, that I may win Christ. Dung, you can't use dung to do anything. Okay, it is, it is, it is no good. That's refuse, that, that, that's supposed to go in a pit and lock up. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is of faith. That I may know him. Watch this now. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This is sanctification right here, being set apart unto Christ. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So here is Paul telling us that, look, all the things I have learned did not bring me to Christ. Now I have let go of all of that so that I may be sanctified unto Christ by the knowledge I have of you. So that at the end of the day, I might be found and counted among those who are resurrecting from the dead. Very important. The sanctification test. This teaching that you are hearing, will, will it affect my salvation and my eternality in Christ Jesus? Will it affect my redemption at the end of the day? Very important. Because everything that I have learned Everything that I know, if at the end of the day, I, I am not risen with Christ from the dead, what was the point? What really was the point? It was a waste of my time and a waste of my brain space. What was the point? Run the sanctification test. Will this teaching cause me to grow in the knowledge and revelation and character of Jesus Christ? Number eight, the final one. Eight tests that we are running to discern and to dissect our foundation. The supreme test. The supreme test. Does this teaching glorify God in spirit? in character and in attributes. We can't list all of them tonight. There are many. Does this teaching glorify God in spirit, in character and in attributes? Colossians chapter three, verse 17. So the final test is about the glorification of God. Colossians three, verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word, so we can look at this now as in what you speak, what you teach, what you preach. Whatever you do in word, in proclamation, or deed that is in action, or your example, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, that is in the authority of Jesus, as coming out of the office of Jesus, as coming out of the person of Jesus, as representing Jesus, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So in other words, this that I am doing, it is all about glorifying God through Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus. What I'm saying and what I'm doing what I'm believing and what I'm accepting and what I'm teaching, is it glorifying Jesus Christ? Because there are many messages that we hear. And believe me, Jesus is not mentioned at all. You don't see how what you do will end in the glorification of God at all. At the end of it, it's all about you and what you will achieve and what you will become. 
and the fame you will get. You see, we have to open our ears now and listen very, very keenly to what is being taught and what is being pushed on us. Because the devil is very subtle. He wants to take the glory of God and give it to another. But we have to be careful that we do not take what belongs to God unto ourselves. And the kind of teaching we receive is powerful enough to do this. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives him. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen and amen. So whatever you do, whatever you say, however you minister, whatever you teach, the litmus test on it is whether or not this thing is glorifying God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, wherefore, whether you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. So here we have it. The eight tests that you are going to run on your foundation. In other words, on the things that you believe, on the messages that you are hearing, on the teachings that you are being taught, to see whether or not they conform to truth, to rightness, and to the purity of the word of the Almighty God. Now, if you can learn this, your foundation will be strong. Your foundation will be strong. Now, what are the effects of wrong teaching on the foundation? Are there any effects? Let's see. Psalm, on, Psalm uh, 11 and verse 3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Destroyed foundations are dangerous, even to righteous people. You see, where your foundation is destroyed, good works and righteous people will not have anything to stand on. Wrong or damaged foundation will result in spiritual catastrophes. And this is where a lot of people find their most difficult battles. Why? Because the foundation is damaged. Foundation, foundational battles are some of the toughest battles to deal with because it, it entails you digging, uprooting, removing, repairing, and at the same time, ensuring that the walls do not collapse. In other words, ensuring that while you are doing this, your spiritual life does not collapse in the process. Foundations are closely related to strongholds. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, you'll find what Paul says about strongholds there. And so this is why in spiritual warfare, when we talk about spiritual warfare, you begin to deal with foundation by repentance so that the mercy of God can undergird you. Without this, you are fighting a losing battle. Without God's mercy, you are fighting a losing battle. And so correct teaching, which deals with the mindsets that give strength to these foundations, is important to repair the foundation. So foundational spiritual warfare, let me just digress a little now, is heavily dependent on words, teachings, prayers, and prophecy, and two, actions. Words to deal with the issues, 
and actions to reset and relay the foundation. So let me give you an example. Israel was in a predicament. In the book of Haggai, you will find some things there. Haggai chapter one, they were experiencing a poor harvest because of the judgment of God. Haggai chapter one, verse five to nine says, now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe, he clothed you, but you are not warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put, in, it in, put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, consider your ways. The second time he's saying this, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Which house is he talking about? He's talking about his house. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is wasted, and you run every man unto his own house. In other words, you are busy building your own carnal life, but your spiritual life is not being built. Your, your body is the temple. You are the temple of the living God. Don't forget that you were created to be an habitation of the Lord. So what was going on with, with the people of Israel in the book of Agai was due to the fact that the teaching they were receiving, as well as the actions they were carrying out, did not glorify God. So God gave them a way to correct all that was going on. He gave them a way to correct it. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 14, then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, said the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer me is unclean. In other words, the people were unclean by virtue of what they were doing, by virtue of what they were being taught, by virtue of the fact that the temple was not standing. Let's continue. Israel was trying to produce good works based on bad teaching. They were trying to offer sacrifices, good works, with unholy hands, wrong spiritual alignment. That is unacceptable. Israel was told that they had to rebuild from the ground up so that all the ambiguities would be corrected. So in other words, if you're going to correct what is going on in your life, you have to revisit the foundation. So in order to do this, two things were required. The building of the house of the Lord, which, de which deals with the teaching process. Okay, Once the house of the Lord goes up, what can you expect from that? Teaching will come. And secondly, the amending of their ways. When you are being taught, your ways will be affected. So the amending of their ways, he said, consider your ways. This would handle the application process. So when this is done, they would realign themselves back to the will of God, back to the character of God, and back to the way of God. Right teaching is therefore imperative for laying a strong foundation on which we build the rest of our spiritual lives. If your teaching is not right, your foundation cannot be right. And if your foundation is not right, your ways cannot be right. And we are having a lot of wrong actions, bad actions in many Christians, simply because they have either not been discipled, not been taught, or refuse to be discipled. Hallelujah. And so those eight tests that I give you, you can learn them. They will help you to discern the foundation of your spiritual life. Amen and amen. We stop here for tonight. Hallelujah. I'm sure your questions are ready and rearing to go. And I would love to hear from you tonight. Floor is open to you. Hi, Prophet. Good night. Good night, Diana. Okay.
Okay. Oh, this was a lot. Okay. So let me let me start from where my trend of thoughts have taken me. First of all, the could you one, please turn on your video? Uh oh, I'm in the dark. <laughs> Please, if you're going to talk, turn on your video. May I please be exempted? I beg. No. Please. Okay. Thank I will only exempt you. I will not exempt anyone else. Thank you so very much. Okay, so I was saying that, um, first of all, whoever divulges any information, the one who stands at the pulpit first must examine the message before that message is given out. Yes. And this has to be done through those seven keys that were given. And the one who was about eight to- Eight keys, not out, seven, eight. Eight keys. The yes. question should be asked, is my message going to spiritually edify one? Will it cause one to get away from that test of secrecy or will it push one into that direction? Will that test of survey now be um, one that this person can literally follow and say, okay, I think I'm in the di right direction or I as the leader, I'm giving the person an opportunity to assess correctly has my message been a stumbling block to that person? Has it sent that person or even me to that place of the serenity test? Will it cause us to be sanctified? Will it take us through that sanctification test? Am I growing from it as well? And is that person going to grow? And last and foremost, the most important, at the end of the day, that supreme test, will it glorify God or am I the one receiving that glory? So yes. that is for the deliverer of that message. The test mm -hmm. first and foremost has to come from, so there has to be some form of introspection. So now I see a danger now on the part of the followers, the congregant, there are those who are held bound to the messages which may very well be rooted in culture and the precepts, the principles of a, that denomination. And these persons hold fast to the teaching that they've gotten and they are convinced within them that they are closer to the pearly gate even if everything in that message is wrong and it is not a, 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 a message that will take them to God to see what God is doing with them and whether or not there is any spiritual growth. I say so because I know that there are persons who hold on to rituals yes. and a lot of churches are teaching, but they do so through their rituals indoctrination that may very well be wrong and people are holding on to these rituals they are sometimes even praying wrong prayers which are far from what jesus himself taught the lord's prayer yes. and do it with that conviction that they when they say it let me apologize to those who will feel offended, that's not the intention, but I take it when the Catholic in particular take their rosary and they begin to um, pray, pray with that, the beads and pray, pray the rosary, that they are the most sanctified of beings. But then there is such false or such um, heresy in what is being done and what is heard that there now needs to be a total mindset that has to be recalibrated for people now to go and assess, assess what they've been fed and do so without holding on to the, the, the need to be connected to a denomination, separate themselves from the denomination, even indeed to separate themselves from the person who, who um, preaches 
And if there is any close connection with the church, the people, they too have to separate, cut off, and do some very deep searching of themselves and ask an honest question. Am I following God or am I following a man and the ways of my church? And so it is when that person can take that matured position, then and only then will that person begin to go through each of these eight steps, be realistic, and make the ultimate decision to run away from such places where this is done, or say, look, let me search the truth through the scripture, because I truly do not know. So this is my um, contribution, my observation, Prophet. Okay. All right. Very good. Now you see, um, you're bringing out some some important things here. Um, Romans chapter eight two. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Very very important passage. Romans eight verse two. The law. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free. From the law of sin and death. Here, here is a very powerful statement I'm going to make. Many churches are not operating according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus does not require you to do anything to be spiritual. It doesn't demand anything of you to be righteous, as in works of your own hands or self. What it simply requires you to do is to believe and accept Jesus as the provision of all that you need and of, and of all that you can be. And the belief and acceptance of that truth of who Christ is and what he has done and what he will do makes you to become everything that he has promised in his word. That sounds too simple to be true. Eh? And so man, what man has done is to now put in a little bit here and a little bit there and a little piece there to augment your spirituality, because this simplicity is too simple. And I think that is what has affected many, that they can't believe that the requirements of the law versus the requirements of grace are so far removed from one another that those in Christ Jesus really and truly Everything that those in the law worked for and sweat for and labored for is just freely given to us by a simple belief of faith and heart. And so you can tell people, you can tell the difference between people who really and truly have met Jesus and those who haven't. Because what will happen is that those who met Jesus who have come into contact with Jesus Christ, there is a freedom that they have that is unparalleled. You will, you, you, you will probably call them even rebellious people. Sometimes you look at them and you will even think that they are insubordinate. No, they are free thinkers, free spirited, because they have met Jesus Christ. They are not bound to any man, to anything, to any building, to any system, to any... No, they are free. Whom the sun set free is free indeed. So they are free from religion, free from religiosity, free from tradition, free from culture, free from rosary, free from uh, 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 moon and sun. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So it's important that we run these tests because look, the strength of your spiritual life is going to be dependent on what you are hearing and what you are receiving and believing. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.
Let's let's have some moments. Are you still there with me? We're all there. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go. Come on, Bible students. Don't don't let me have to start calling names now. Prophet. Hello, yes. Prophet. Good night, Samantha. Yeah. Welcome. Good night. You tell the people them say that they must turn on the, the, the video on Prophet. I look like who did it right now. Okay, all right. We don't want to see who did it. Keep it up. And that's why nobody not talking to you because they don't want to turn on the video. <laughs> okay. We, we revoke that statement. Okay. So, so that people can talk to me. Oh, boy. Right. So, um... These eight, boy, I tell you, these eight um, rules, laws, whatever, to, to dissect and interpret a message, boy, it's really interesting. I used to like, um, what is that guy's, um, uh, Farrakhan. Okay. Yeah. I used to like listening to Farrakhan, right? Mm -hmm. And now I have dissected with these eight rules that you have given, right? And I find that, as Diana says, a lot of us are bound to the precepts of our culture or our religion or whatever we, we have been brought up in. So I find that he teaches from his culture, his religion, uh, some racism mixed with some truth, mixed with a bit of education, but nothing from, uh, is that uh, number four, the spiritual test where the question asks, am I being forced to believe the opinions of a man or is it truly the spirit of the word of God? So now I have to throw all that through the door and revamp because now I'm, I'm giving these eight um, rules for a message. So now I cannot help but to identify or to dissect or to uh, look into whatever the message is. So now this is what I come up with. Like he's not teaching from the spirit of God. It's from all those other things that I've said. And darn me for liking or indulging. But yeah. I will ask God for repentance. I will go to my prayer room and ask God to forgive me because it was in ignorance. So, amen. Amen. And not only just that guy. I mean, let's look at that guy. I've, I've listened to him to hear what is it that he preached. And listen, brethren, 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 hear me very, hear me very well. The moment a religion, a persuasion, a philosophy, a teaching calls, calls you to hate others, it can never be of God. Never. Never be of God. Never. And a, a lot of teachings out there from these guys is racism on the opposite end of the spectrum. It is unforgiveness, bitterness, and hate mixed up with deceit, a little bit of factual information here and there, and a hodgepodge of mess. If we are going to believe Jesus Christ, we must believe him. We are not pushing Jesus Christ because he's the white man's God. <laughs> we are not saying Jesus Christ because we have been duped and indoctrinated and fooled by our colonial masters. We are saying Jesus Christ because evidence and fact proof 
that he is the son of the most high God. Evidence and fact proves this. And there are those who can skillfully divert your eyes from the evidence that is right before you. That's the devil's greatest playbook. That's his playbook. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say something to you. I was sharing this with Brother Cavell this morning. Let me share something with you. Why is it that the devil hates us so much? Why? Have you ever considered it? Why is it that he is our enemy? Why? Do you realize that at the end of all things and the consummation of all things, we, the believers, are going to be sitting in the office of God? Now, this might be too much for some of you, but hear me out. The Bible says we are going to be seated at the right hand of God. That is a place of power. That's a place of authority. And that's an office. It's called the office of Godhood. In other words, whatever Jesus is and whoever Jesus is, we are going to be like him. We are going to be so elevated above all of humanity and creation. Above angels and everything else that exists in creation. That when they look at us, the respect and the honor that will come to us is befitting only to a God. Do you know what the devil said? He said, I will ascend above the stars of God. Why would he want to ascend above the angels when he was already above them? So it could never be the angels that he was talking about. Because he was a cherub of cherubs, one that covers. He was the anointed cherub, not just any cherub, anointed cherub. And he was also a musician, a worshiper, a seraph. And he was also an archangel. So this being that we are talking about is not no low class being, high class, high rank, high up there. And somehow he got an, an opportunity, a glimpse to see that look, God had a plan to put somebody else above him in an office that he desired. Do you understand? The, 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 it's not God's position he wanted. He wants our position. Be like the Most High. We are going to be like the Most High. When we see him, we shall be like him. We do not know yet what we shall appear. But when we see him, we shall be like him. And we shall be at his right hand. That's where the devil wanted. And that's why he hates us so much. And so to prevent us from getting what God has planned from the foundation of the world, he will do everything to destroy our foundation so that we will not reach the point where we can be redeemed unto that. And so all these teachers, like the man you referred to and others, come out with a hodgepodge of mess. They sound good. They sound intelligent. They sound wise. But what's the spirit behind it? And if we should follow what they are teaching, where will it end us? In the black KKK? More hate? More hurt? More pain? How will we atone for what the white man has done to the black people? By enslaving them? Do you understand that Jesus is the only one who teaches real forgiveness and real love? So you, you, you're looking at all of this and, and this that you have received tonight, these eight tests that you're going to run on a message that you hear will help you because it will help you also to search the scriptures and to find out, should I accept this? Should I believe this? Should I run with this? So I'm, I'm not giving to you something that is shallow. I told you this is basic, but this, this, this is basically deep. 
Yes, it's Bible basics, but it is basically deep. Hallelujah. Let's, let's hear from somebody else. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for your honesty. You're welcome. Because not many people are as honest like you are. Some of them are there listening to some, to, to, to some things. All, all one Indian guru that, 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 that they sit down and talking like he's a wise man. But all that he's talking is a hodgepodge of mess. No wisdom whatsoever. Wisdom of the world, but not the wisdom of God and of Christ. Let's hear from somebody else. Come on, talk to me. We're in the classroom, free to talk. You don't have to open your video because Samantha says some of you don't look so hot, so that's why you don't want to open it. Understand. Prophet, yes. um, you said something earlier when you mm -hmm. said that um, Satan, um, the devil would want or position, yes, right? And uh, um, it's kind of processing because yes, I know he doesn't want us to, to get into the kingdom, but what I don't understand clearly, mm -hmm. wasn't he, didn't he have a position up there but because of his rebelliousness and in bad mind, why him get kicked out in the first place? So I am saying, Yes, him don't want to get us in there, but I would have I I would have thought that he basically just wanted that high rank position, maybe to be, but then technically is us to the right <laughs> hand of Jesus. Yes, my answer my own question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I got okay. it. <laughs> let, let me help you. Let, let me let me bring you back to Isaiah fourteen. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, you which did weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. <laughs> oh boy, was he not already there? So where is he want to ascend to? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. You see, <laughs> here, here, here is the dilemma. Yes, I have heard this preached and taught that this is the angels of God. But when you really examine it, and we have, we have just done literary devices in the Bible, when you really examine this and connect the dots, who are the stars of God? Who are they? Because remember I told you, Ezekiel allow you to understand about the cherubim. Revelation allow you to understand that he's the great dragon, the seraph. You understand that, that that's a seraph. The description there in Revelation is the same description that is in Isaiah for the seraphims. So he's a cherubim, he's a seraphim, he's an archangel. In other words, all of those realms he's in. So where is he going to ascend to? But now you see an, a, a class of beings introduced, the stars of God. And I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He's telling you where he wants to go. You understand me? And the Bible tells you the rest, okay? Really and truly, when you analyze this thing deeply, he's angry that God would so consider man. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you will visit him? Do you understand that we are the only set of creatures that God has created that he died for? The angels that sinned, he prepared hell for them. But we mankind that sinned, he came and died. Uh, don't uh, Listen, that's a whole different teaching for tonight. Don't, don't dissect me. Let's talk about the teaching that we're dealing with tonight. This is why the devil is a deceiver. Why is he that he a deceiver? Because he has come to teach us things that will get us to depart from the true purpose and plan of God to raise us to the right hand of the Father, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places, to be seated with who? With Jesus in heavenly places, not with Michael or with Uriel or with whoever else is up there, or with Gabriel or Raphael or, or Donatello, eh? not with the Ninja Turtles. He's, he, he, he has called us, brethren, to be seated with Christ. With him. Do you all 
know the, what that means and the implications of that. That's deep. So how do we, how do you affect that? How do you prevent those who are destined to go there not to get there? Wrong teaching. Wrong teaching produce wrong believing, produce wrong action. And if you can get a man to produce wrong action, then you will get that man to stir the anger of God against him. This is why teaching is important. And what you put in your foundation is important. Let's, let's, let's talk. Somebody else here, let's go. Let's talk about what we just heard, the teaching we just heard. Good evening, Prophet, and everyone. Good evening. Um, Good night. Well, observation. I've, I've observed, and maybe I'm learning, that a yes. number of church leaders, yes. those who are teaching, have not been taught. Mm -hmm. um, it's Very like important. some yes. persons believe that God will tell them everything. And as I said, some of the foundation is that some persons... And I hear other persons who, and maybe this is how you find out, some of them have not been formally at the feet of someone else who has learned and dissected the word. They say, God will teach them, or they say, oh, we're not going to Bible school or whatever, and they use that term. And I think that's why a lot of people, the foundation is not right, because they're saying, there, oh, open your mouth and God will fill it with words. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it so often. I think that's why a lot of us, the foundation is not right. So when we hear, I can't speak for myself, when I hear the teaching now from you and a few others, I keep hearing um, some persons are not taught. But how, how are you going to reach those people to stop um, misleading and creating this foundation that's shaky for other persons? Well, here's the truth. Um, there, there are some people that um, scoff at intellectualism. Okay, let me not use the word intellectualism. Um, knowledge. Okay. Um, they scoff at the fact that God can educate a man by whatever means he chooses to, whether he uses a mentor, whether he uses a discipleship process, or he uses the Bible school, okay? And because some of them have not gone through that process, be it mentorship, discipleship, or Bible school, they feel inferior and insecure, and their insecurities and their inferiorities are coming out in a cover-up. Okay, follow me. It's coming out in a cover-up. And that cover-up makes you feel as if education is not important. I think it's in the book of Deuteronomy that it says, train up a child in the way he should grow, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That training there involves both teaching and practicum. Training is about practical application of what is, is you, are, you are being taught. So when the Bible says train up a child, you cannot teach me how to be practical without instruction. Come on. You have to have some instruction. So what is the instruction that you are using to teach me? Okay. So you tell me, okay, uh, let's say, for example, we're doing some electricity and electronics. Are you teaching me about stringing up wires. And here is what you tell me. Connect the black wire to the negative part of the battery and connect the red wire to the positive part of the battery. And you tell me, say, listen, I say you must do it. Now, what if it's not black wire, but green wire? And what if it's not red wire, but orange wire? And you not there now. Which why am I gonna put where, boss? It really and truly, it wasn't about the black wire or the red wire. 
That wasn't the issue. The real issue was about negative polarity and positive polarity and being able to identify the different polarities so that I can connect them right. And so even if I put red wire on, on the negative polarity and the black wire on the positive polarity, as long as they are connected right and the colors may be wrong, it still produced the correct result. So it wasn't the wire. It was an understanding of the polarities. So in other words, if you don't understand the theory, how can you understand the practical? And so here we have people, just like you're saying, who are trying to teach us the practical, but they have not the theory. Yeah. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. And then they say, oh, and then you ask them, but pastor, why is this so? I saw it for God, man. I saw, I saw my pastor do it, and I saw the church do it, and I saw you for do it. Really, pastor? That's the best you can give to me? Let us not believe that knowledge is evil. We have to come out of this. Christians have a mindset. I'm not saying all, but there are some Christians that have a mindset, a prevailing mindset to believe that knowledge is evil. Knowledge is not evil. Knowledge outside of Christ Jesus and knowledge that does not lead to a glorification of Christ will produce evil. But we need to be taught. We need to know some things. We need to, 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 to have some theory, man. Because if you don't have correct doctrine, if you don't have correct teaching, your actions are going to be wrong. I told you about the guy who went on 21 days of fasting and he came back and he said he had a revelation that God gave him. And I said, I want to hear the revelation. And I was keen on hearing a revelation out of 21 days of fasting because that, that is no joke. And the boy began to talk. The young man began to talk how Jesus was the prodigal son. And I said, well, I don't know everything. I need to know how Jesus is the prodigal son. And he, and he began to talk and he began to talk. And yes, the boy was sounding good. He was sounding nice. And he was sounding eloquent until I asked him one question. One question I asked him and mashed up his 21 days. I said to him, so please tell me in all of this now, how did Jesus waste his father's goods? And he looked at me and looked at me and looked at me and said, well, I didn't get that part of the revelation. I said, well, maybe you have to do 21 more days. <laughs> <laughs> understand I said, maybe you have to do 21 more days or, you know to get that part of course you know I was being cheeky mm -hmm. you see <laughs> if we are not taught eh? and then what, what, what is it that led him into 21 days to believe that he's going to get a message from God that is going to be contrary to scripture it must be some teaching he heard that fasting will make him hear the voice of God but how does fasting make you hear the voice of God? That's the next question. So here, here you are pointing out something very true, very real, Janet, that a lot of our leaders are not taught, are not mentored, are not discipled, are not schooled, and they are attempting to mentor, disciple, and school others. With what? Because here is truth, here is truth, here is truth. Let's say God calls you to go and start a ministry, go and start a church or something. And the calling of God is on your life and the anointing is there. And you start and you start preaching and you know the gifts are flowing and people get attracted and, and all of that is happening. Now, when the gifts not flowing, because they don't always flow. When the gifts not flowing, what are you going to use to hold them? Number one. Number two, when the intellectuals begin to be attracted to your church, 
when people of substance, financially, socially, begin to come into your church, the doctors, the lawyers, those who have gone to university, those who have been schooled, and they come to your church, and they begin to listen to you, the English teachers, eh? They don't play with the English teachers, eh? Because those ones, they will sit down there and they will dissect your words and say, no prophet, no, 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 there's, there's no S. There's no S on that. That's, that's singular. No S on that one. And your English sounds like you're coming out of a boot to ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Listen to me. You're not hearing the message. You're hearing the English. Exactly. It's, it's the truth. You're hearing the English, not the message. Eh? You, you, you don't want to sit down and listen to somebody saying he, he has had, or no, 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 or something like, you know, uh, let me see if I can put something in a wrong way. Um, they, was. Uh, they, 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 they was there. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, something like that. Eh? And you're hearing the, the, the misplacement of verbs and nouns and 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 all of that kind of stuff it, it, it's gonna affect you and i'm, I'm not just saying this in a it, it jokingly it, it's gonna affect you and it's going to affect the people who are learned among you because listen education is a gift it's a blessing let's not fool ourselves it's a gift it's a blessing and if god calls a man but doesn't allow him to go into the universities of the world. There is a university that he sends that man through. And you won't know the difference as to whether or not that man went to university yet or nay. You will, you will have to ask him, uh, prophet, which university did you go again? Where did you study? And the person wants to know because they want to go to the same school that, that, that you went to because of what is being produced out of you. And you will tell them, it's the university of the spirit. And they will look at you and, and shake their head and say, man. Because they won't know the difference. So it, it, there's nothing wrong with education. What is wrong is when we scoff at education as if it is not important. Jesus was a rabbi. Don't take that lightly. He was learned. He was learned. Thank you, Kabel. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yes. And because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me. You, you see how powerful that is? The same book of Hosea that I just um, quoted to you. Because you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will also forget your children. This, this is powerful stuff. You understand? Powerful stuff. See my wife saying, was is a singular helping, very... And there is a plural pronoun. Both subject and verb must agree. If the subject is singular, the verb must also be singular. See the English teacher coming out, coming out of her there. Yes. Yes. So that's, that's very important, Janet. I, I, I'll appreciate that point that you brought up there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's have somebody else. Come on, talk to me. The eight tests that you just heard. The eight tests. Come on. These are very powerful. Scriptural test, secrecy test, survey test, spiritual test, stumbling test, serenity test, sanctification test, supreme test. Come on, we still have a little bit more time. Prophet Bernard, is it that when you yes. do the test, for example, let's say you're under leadership, like some persons have grown up in a church or they've been worshiping at a church for a number of years, yes. and, um, maybe hold offices. So it's hard uh -huh. to take away. Is it that when you do the test, um, you may find that you may two parts, two parts of the test may be okay, but the others you question. Is it that you have to find a problem with all eight then you decide mm -mm, the teaching is wrong or you just look at each question for each aspect. They work in tandem with each other. Okay. 
all of them work in tandem with each other. You understand? It's, it's one test with eight parts. Let's, let's put it that way. Okay. 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 It's one yes. test with eight, eight parts or eight levels to it. Okay. It can't be right in one area and wrong in another. <laughs> okay. Wrong is wrong. Period. Okay. okay. You understand? And what needs to be corrected must be corrected because there are some people who get it right in one area but get it wrong in another area. You, mm -hmm. you understand? And if you get it wrong in one area, remember, you're not presenting a piece of bread. You're presenting a loaf of bread. Okay. You, you understand? So if a part of the bread is spoiled, then the whole bread is going to be affected. That's right. If a part of the rock is weak, then the whole structure of the rock is going to be affected by that one little weakness that is there. So this first thing, this would be prodding, pushing, well, for me, to go mm. deep into the denomination I'm associated with, or not just the teachers I hear on the web or I visit a church and hear, but it's, it's going all the way back to denomination or where you're affiliated then. Yeah, definitely. We, we need to ask questions. We need to ask questions about what we are being taught. There's there nothing wrong with that. If somebody is offended by you asking them, why do you believe that Jesus is the only way to God? They must be able to prove it and show you. You understand? They must be able to. Because logically speaking, that don't look like that makes sense. Why would a God who loves variety only create one way to get to it? These are some of the questions that New Agers ask. These are some of the questions that people of today are asking. We look at God as a God of variety. So why is it that he's, he only creates one way to get to him? Hmm? You know, th these, are, these are some of the things that we need to ask. I was reading an article. Um, uh, somebody is questioning the whole matter of Christians' response to COVID. And they're saying, but if you believe that God is all powerful and God can heal and God can deliver, why are you hiding from COVID? <laughs> so we, we must be ready to give an answer to every man that asks of us our salvation. We, this is not the time to joke around. Maybe you could get away in 1960. This is 2021, my friend. This is not a joke time. We, we have to fix some things. Okay? We have to fix some stuff. All right. Prophet. Um, yeah. I, I am processing all of this because mm -hmm. as Sister Janet asked earlier, if there is one area that is outer line, that means the foundation is shaky. Yes. It doesn't matter what we're saying. If mm -hmm. one out of this eight is not aligned properly, that means our foundation, we need to revamp, we need to restructure. There's a lot of things because I am here going through the, the eight and I'm telling you, I, I am seeing some working and some not working. Yeah. So that's why we are having the challenges that we face with as, as believers. And then someone will say something and because we learn something elsewhere, we are having the conflict. We are, we are, we are having this struggle. And for me as a believer, um, I think it was Charmaine earlier. I, I think that's her name, the one that repented. As a believer, these things we really need to repent for because mm -hmm. it's not, some of it is not our fault, you know, but when we know it is a problem, we have to go before God because when I'm looking at this, I, there's a lot of teaching. I've gotten like from good teachers, but yes. all eight is not matching. Right. <laughs> it's not aligned properly. And then now I will see why you teach when when you taught us last week about our foundation we have to make sure that we are on a proper structure 
I yes. understand completely why you had to start with that one first before you went into this. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't know what to do in the first class, the, how to get the infrastructure and the building right, then we cannot apply the eight. That's true. So I am looking, I am looking deep into this and I, I, I trust me, I've been re, I re, I read the foundation that you did last week, like many times I've been going over it. And mm -hmm. now tonight I am troubled, like really troubled, but the trouble yes. is good. It's good prof profit because then I can correct. I can start making correction. I can start if I need to re, re um to start all over, or I have to lick out something and put back something or something. I have to fix the foundation because it is shaky. Yes, it is Definitely. shaky. It is shaky, and I I I just have to give God thanks, you know, because or my eyes have been opening for uh, for the last few months with your teaching and with somebody else and mm -hmm. and i and i and i and i just have to just give god thanks because this teaching is not it is not something that you're going to sit in a church and hear you're not you're not so there's a lot of believers that are struggling right now in in the house of God because they don't know these things and that's why the gifts are not manifesting they're not functioning and they're not working properly and that's why so many sick people are in the church definitely because we are we, you, we're not on it yes let me give you an example um amen thank you thank you Kim 